So in this unit, we're going to be looking at the phenomenon known as simple harmonic motion, specifically what simple harmonic motion is and where do we see it in everyday life. So to get us started, we'll start by looking at an example of simple harmonic motion um, that we're all familiar with, specifically springs. We'll look at springs to define what simple harmonic motion is, and then look at the physics of simple harmonic motion, which forms the basis for our introductory topic to this unit, 5.1 Hooke's Law. So we're going to consider what's happening with a spring here in order to help us define what it means for an object to be in simple harmonic motion. Okay. So um, if we stretch a spring, all right, beyond, let's say we have a spring that has a point, a resting point of x naught, meaning where its natural length is. If we pull that spring beyond its natural length, what you're going to notice is the spring is going to start fighting back against your pulling to pull it back to its natural length. So we can say that there's a spring force that's acting um, to restore your object back to its original length right here. We can have this, in this case, if I'm pulling to the right, the spring force will act to the left. The same way if I compress my spring um, below the um, natural length of the spring, the spring now is going to fight back in order to try and push itself back to its natural length. So in this case, if I push my spring and compress it to the left, the spring is going to apply force to the right in order to attempt to apply itself or bring itself back to its natural length. And we can feel this in terms of the resistance we feel when we stretch or compress a spring. So as a result, we can say that the spring seems to fight back against us, wanting to move back to its starting position. In addition, what we can also take note of is that there are different levels of stiffness for different levels of spring. Springs, for example, the springs in a pen, um, in a ballpoint pen, are a lot less stiff than the springs that make up the suspension system of a car. Um, so specifically, if your spring is more stiff, the more the spring will fight back against you. So it's a lot easier to stretch out a spring from a ballpoint pen than it is to stretch out the spring from a suspension system because of the stiffness of the spring. So the more stiff the spring, the more, spring, the, more the spring will fight back against you. In addition, what we can also take note of is that um, depending on the degree to which we stretch or compress the spring, um, we're going to either feel the spring fight back more or less against us. So for example, if I just stretch my spring a little bit here or compress my spring a little bit here, I'm going to feel a lot less resistance and a lot less fighting back than if I were to stretch my string, string, eh, spring excuse me, all the way out to here or compress my spring all the way back to this part specific point. So the further the spring is stretched or compressed from the starting position, the more the spring will fight back against us. So um, what is the spring, what do we call the spring force? What is it an example of and how can it help us define what um, simple harmonic motion is, okay? So the spring force, F of S, is an example of a restorative slash elastic force. Um, it's so-called because the force acts to restore our spring back to its natural starting position. What we call this natural starting position or natural length is we call it the equilibrium position. Okay, so if a spring has a, um, if a spring right here has an unstretched length right here that will mark as zero, then stretching it a distance f is x is going to result in a spring exerting a force upwards in order to pull it back to its equilibrium length. The same way is if I keep pulling downwards, shown by this red arrow right here, um, there's going to be more resistance offered by a spring to bring it back to its original length, okay? What we call the equilibrium position. So in terms of quantifying what we've been talking about, we quantify the stiffness of the spring by what we call a spring constant K, which has units of newtons per meter, all right? It gives you, amount to, it gives you an idea of the amount of force, aka newtons, that you need to stretch a spring a, per, um, a certain distance, so newtons per meter. The more stiff your spring is, the higher spring constant will be, meaning that it requires more newtons, um, um, requires more force in order to stretch your spring out for a certain distance. All right. Um, in addition, restorative force such as the spring force, F of S, is directly proportional to the displacement from equilibrium X, meaning how far we are from our natural starting position. This is what we call Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law, again, states that restorative force such as spring force is directly proportional to displacement from equilibrium. So, Hooke's law, in terms of a more succinct mathematical condition, states, states that our elastic restorative force is proportional to our um, displacement from equilibrium x. Okay, so this forms the basis for Hooke's law. Any force that obeys this type of relationship, any force that obeys a relationship where it is directly proportional to the um, displacement from equilibrium, 
satisfies Hooke's law. So this doesn't just go for springs, but this goes for any system that can be modeled according to this mathematical relationship. Combine the last two conditions regarding the stiffness of the spring and the um, direct relationship between um, our force and displacement for equilibrium, we can write down an equation for restorative forces. So for Hooke's law in mathematical form, it states that the spring force is equal to the hook is equal to the um, spring constant times the, times the displacement from equilibrium of our spring. Okay? We can see this captures everything that we've seen so far, because if we increase k, that means f of s is also going to increase because we have a direct relationship between k and f of s. So the more stiff we make our spring, the stronger the force is going to be. Um, to restore to equilibrium. In addition, the farther we pull our spring from equilibrium or compress our spring from equilibrium, represented by x right here, the larger that spring force is going to be in order to bring our spring back to its equilibrium position. So uh, let's look at an example here. Example one, working, working with Hooke's law. Students are trying to determine the spring constant of a spring using a motion sensor in a two kilogram mass. The spring is stretched 1.5 meters from the equilibrium position, as shown at right. The moment upon being released, the motion sensor records an acceleration of 1.6 meters per second squared. We want to know what is the spring constant of the spring. So Hooke's law involves forces, which means we're going to have to be working with Newton's second law on dynamics here. Okay? So as the spring is stretched to the right, the restorative force of the spring will act to the left because we want to bring these, um, for, we want to bring the mass back to equilibrium position. Upon being released, immediately upon being released, our, released excuse me, our free body diagram will look like this. We're going to have our spring force acting to the left. We're going to have a normal force from the surface right here acting upwards, and we're going to have the force due to gravity of the block acting downwards. We don't worry about the spring. We assume that the spring is massless. Again, it's an approximation we make in order to simplify these problems right here. So as a result, if we focus on Newton's second law in the x direction right here, okay, we're going to have our sum of forces equals mass times acceleration in the x direction, which in this case our only force in the x direction is going to be the um, spring force acting to the left. So we're going to have negative f of x, f of s, excuse me, equals m times our horizontal acceleration. So as a result, if we replace f of s with the equation for the spring with the equation um, for spring force, Hooke's law, we have negative spring constant times our displacement from equilibrium equals m times ax. Okay. So as a result, we're going to have negative k times 1.5 meters. 1.5 meters being our stretching from the equilibrium position. We're going to have two kilograms as our mass, and we're going to have negative 1.6 meters per second squared as our acceleration. Note here that the acceleration is listed as positive in the um, problem statement, but we can infer that this is actually going to be a negative acceleration because our force is going to be acting to the left to bring our object back to equilibrium, which means our system is going to be accelerating to the left. So we're going to have a negative acceleration right here. Okay. So as a result, we can solve this equation right here for k, which is going to give us k equals 2 kilograms times 1.6 meters per second squared divided by 1.5, or waiting for this bar at the bottom to disappear, 2.13 newtons per meter. All right, since k is a constant, we should get a positive number here, which is why another reason um, from perspective of mathematics that these negative signs have to cancel out. And this is our introduction to Hooke's Law. In 5.2, we'll look at how we can use Hooke's Law um, to generalize from a spring to any scenario um, where Hooke's Law applies and use that to define what simple harmonic motion is.